Good day, it's uh, the brain injured guy, Chris Bacon here, coming to you with part two of uh, providing legal services to people with disabilities, final December 17th, 2010 doc, doc uh, by the Arts Disability. Uh, I guess we'll go back and we'll reread that part. <clears throat> So the author, again, I didn't think of that, I guess. I gotta do two parts in case somebody sees this from the beginning. Only part two from the beginning. Okay, so the uh, again, the document is providing legal services to people with disabilities, December 2010. It's put out by Arts Disability Law Center or also known as Arts Disability Law Management. Um, 425 Bloor Street East, Suite 110, Toronto, Ontario, M4W3R5. That's M as in Michael, 4W as in Walter, 3R as in Richard, 5. Uh, on the internet, they can be found at www.artsdisabilitylaw.ca. Uh, there are 800 numbers for contact are 1-866-482-ARCH for art, that's for arts disability obviously. Uh, those numbers are 2724, so again the full number 1-866-482-2724, that's toll free to the main line. Uh, if you're uh, hearing uh, impaired, then uh, you'd want to use their TTY line. Um, that's 1-866-482-ARCT, uh, which is 2728. Again, that number is 1-866-482-2728. Uh, for facts, plain old-fashioned facts or whatever, um, 1-866-881-ARCF, which is obviously for facts. Those numbers are 2723, so it would be one 881 Two seven two three is the fax number. Um, where we left off uh, at end of part one was we were at uh, the bottom of page fifteen, just about the start section three, I believe. So uh, hopefully this finds you all well and uh, healthy, staying safe out there on the job and in hospitals or whatever. And keeping make sure you understand you're the one who's looking out for your own safety. Nobody else is. They just say they are. Anyway, uh, most people, anyway. Um, okay, so here we are at the top of uh, page 16 of 30, about to start part two. So, three, the rules of professional conduct and clients with disabilities. 3.1, general. The Law Society of Upper Canada's rules of professional conduct, or rules, contain two important references to disability. These are the rule relating to clients under a disability, which is rule 2.02, .02, uh, subsection 6, and the rules relating to discrimination, rule 5.04 and rule 1.031b. It is essential to be aware of and follow these rules when serving clients with disabilities or clients who have a family member with a disability. 3.2, client under a disability and capacity to instruct counsel. The rule of professional conduct that relates most specifically to clients who have disabilities is rule 2.2, subsection 6, client under a disability. It should be read in conjunction with rule 5.04 relating to discrimination and rule 3.01 relating to making legal services available. When representing clients with disabilities, lawyers must follow three main requirements that arise from these rules. Firstly, when a client has a disability or their ability to make decisions is impaired, the lawyer must maintain a normal lawyer and client relationship as far as reasonable pos reasonably possible. That's uh, uh, footnote 75. Secondly, a lawyer and client relationship requires that a client have legal capacity to give instructions, footnote 76. This requirement also arises because the relationship of a lawyer to his or her client is one of agent to principal, subnote, or, uh, footnote 77. A valid relationship of agency requires that a principal have the requisite mental capacity to engage in the relationship, footnote 78. Thirdly, when a client does not have legal capacity to manage his or her legal affairs, the lawyer has an ethical obligation to ensure that the client's interests are not abandoned, and that's footnote 79. 
end of paragraph, so we'll go to those footnotes. That's uh, 75 through 79. 75 says rule 2.02 parentheses 6. Uh, footnote 76, commentary to rule 2.026. 77 says Schurer, C S C H E R E R versus Paletta, P A L E T T A, 1966. 57 D L R, parentheses 2D, 532 at 534, Ontario C A. Footnote 70. Eight is Godelli versus Pauli, Committee of, and that's G O D E L I E versus P A U L I, in brackets, Committee of. Square parentheses 1990, O J number 1207 at 5, District Court. 79 is Commentary to Rule 2.026. New paragraph. Most clients, including those who have disabilities, have the mental ability to instruct counsel. However, lawyers rec agonize over those infrequent situations when a client's mental ability is such that they are not sure if the client has the requisite legal capacity to instruct. As lawyers are precluded from are precluded from acting on behalf of an incapable client, they are necessarily under an obligation to assess their client's capacity to instruct. In this context, legal capacity is a legal determination, not a clinical assessment. Footnote 80. However, lawyers are not trained to undertake this task, and rules do not specify how this is to be done. End of paragraph. Footnote 80. Judith Wall, Capacity and Capacity Assessment in Ontario, paper prepared for the CBA Elder Law Program, March 2006. At page 5, Online is http backspace backspace or backslash backslash practice pro dot ca backslash practice backslash pdf backslash backup underscore capacity dot pdf and backup capacity are both with capitals. New paragraph. In sorting out these situations, it is important to remember that the lawyer and client relationship is founded on the principle of autonomy. The lawyer's obligation is to respect the client's right to make decisions wherever possible. Clients are entitled to make decisions that we believe may be foolish, unwise, or risky as long as they are competently made. That's footnote 81. End of paragraph. Footnote 81, Starson versus Swayze, that's S-T-A-R-S-O-N v Swayze, S-W-A-Y-Z-E, square parentheses 2003 and parentheses S-C-R-722, comma, 2003 S-C-C-32 at para 76. New paragraph. Further, one should never presume that because someone has a disability, he or she is necessarily incapable to instruct. There is no reason to believe that a person who is unable to speak, for example, is not mentally capable. Lawyers are required to look at the capacity of the client to make decisions about his or her legal affairs, footnote 82. Thus, the requisite level of capacity depends on the specific situation. Courts have recognized varying levels of mental capacity. A person may be mentally cap capable of making a basic decision, not capable of making a complex decision. Footnote 83. For example, a client with a developmental intellectual disability may have the mental ability to instruct you to find a remedy relating to poor treatment she receives in a group home, but may not understand the information necessary to instruct you to make a will. Footnotes 82 and 83. That's end of the paragraph, by the way. Uh, footnote 82, commentary to rule 2.026. 83 is Calvert, and then in brackets, litigation guardian of, and bracket, V. Calvert, uh, 1997. So, uh, C-A-L-V-E-R-T on both cases of Calvert versus Calvert. Uh, 3-2-O-R, bracket, 3-D, and bracket, 281, bracket, general division, and bracket and Torok versus Toronto Transit Commission, T O R O K versus Toronto Com Transit Commission, 2007, O J number 1773, Ontario Superior Court of Justice. 
Sorry about the yawning. Lawyers should ensure that clients are given the opportunity to use the supports they need to enhance their ability to make their own decisions. Thus, a client who initially appears to be incapable of being may be able to make his or her own decisions with the help of others, such as family members and friends. These people may assist the client by communicating using words that he or she is familiar with, explaining information, and helping him or her understand the consequences of making a decision. If a client's legal capacity is an issue, a lawyer should document how any decision regarding his or her legal capacity was made and on what basis it was made. Lawyers should not decline to represent a client only because they are unsure if he or she is mentally capable. While lawyers do, not, while lawyers do have a general right to decline a particular representation, the commentary to Rule 3.01 states that this right must be exercised prudently, particularly if the probable result would be to make it difficult for a person to obtain legal advice or representation. For more guidance on the issue of capacity to instruct counsel, reference may be made to a paper by Phyllis Gordon, Notes on Capacity to Instruct Counsel, which is footnote 84. So footnote 84 is Phyllis Gordon, Notes on Capacity to Instruct Counsel from November 2003. Online, it's at Arch Disability Law Center, http backslash backslash www.archdisabilitylaw.ca backslash question mark q equals notes hyphen capacity hyphen instruct hyphen counsel notes capacity instruct counsel for all lowercase. That's the end of page 17 of 30. Okay, so Rule 1.031B reinforces this requirement stating that a lawyer has special responsibilities including a special responsibility to recognize the diversity of the Ontario community, to protect the dignity of individuals and to respect human rights laws in force in Ontario. Ontario's Human Rights Code provides that people with disabilities have a right to be free from discrimination because of their disabilities with respect to services, footnote 85. Like all other services in Ontario, legal services are subject to the provisions of the Human Rights Code. Lawyers and law firms have a legal obligation to ensure that services are offered that are accessible to people with disabilities and do not discriminate. The obligation to, do not, or the obligation to not discriminate includes an obligation to accommodate people with disabilities up to the point of undue hardship. <coughs> Sorry. Ontario Human Rights Commission's Policy and Guidelines on Disability and the Duty to Accommodate, footnote 86. Oh, sorry, i got to go back to footnote 85 because that was end of, end of, uh, end of paragraph. So uh, footnote 85 is code super note 29 at section 1. New paragraph. The Ontario Human Rights Commission's Policy and Guidelines on Disability and the Duty to Accommodate, footnote 86 sets out in detail the views of the Commission regarding accommodation for people with disabilities. While not legislation, the guidelines are an essential starting point for understanding the duty to make appropriate accommodations short of undue hardship for people with disabilities. The guidelines do not contain a formula for determining which accommodations must be provided. Accommodation is an individualized, individualized process and will require different solutions in different cases depending upon the specific client and his or her disability related needs. Footnote 86 is Guidelines on Disability, Supra Note 5. End of paragraph, start of a new paragraph. It is important to emphasize that since lawyers are obligated to provide accommodations, the cost of accommodations must be borne by lawyers. Expenditures on accommodations, sign language interpreters, are not disbursements that may be charged back to clients. Some accommodation measures entail no cost and are accomplished by changes to law firm policies. For example, broad policies prohibiting all animals from the offices have the effect of preventing access to people with guide dogs or other service animals. An amendment to such policy to exempt disability-related service animals would cost nothing at all. 4. General information regarding disabilities and practical considerations for accommodating clients. That's section 4. Section 4.1, General. Too often, people with disabilities report that lawyers refuse to consider representing them because of their unfamiliarity with the person's particular disability. For example, someone who has a speech-related disability may find his or her call to a law office inappropriately screened out by the receptionist. It is hoped that this section of the paper will provide information that will increase a lawyer's comfort level with representing clients with disabilities. In this regard, recall that lawyers are obliged to respect the 
requirements of the of human rights laws, including Ontario's Human Rights Code, footnote 87. The rules further state that, quote, a lawyer shall ensure that no one is denied services or receives inferior services on the basis of the grounds set out in this rule, which is uh, footnote 88. Lawyers must therefore not deny services on the ground that an individual has a disability. End of paragraph. So 87 and 88. 87 says rule 5.041. 88 says rule 5.042. End of footnotes. It is important to remember that each person who has a disability is a unique individual. While disabilities are often categorized into types, each person with a disability experiences it differently. Individuals with the same disability may require different accommodations. There is no single way to accommodate a particular disability. Additionally, some people have more than one disability. We have included the information in this section to provide lawyers with guidance that might assist them in representing their clients with disabilities, ensuring that they receive the accommodations they need. However, the best source of information about your client's disability and accommodation needs is from him or her directly. It is often helpful to ask your clients ab about how disability affects them. Disability organizations can also provide useful information about accommodating specific disabilities. Some clients with disabilities may require certain accommodations. Ask clients what, if any, accommodations are required or would be helpful. Clients with accommodation needs will appreciate such a question at the start of an interview or when the interview is scheduled. If they can address, for instance, whether the seating arrangements and environment will permit effective communication with the lawyer, when would be an appropriate time to take a break and so on. If it is anticipated that there may be a number of accommodation needs, then the lawyer may canvas and address these in advance of the meeting. Lawyers may want to develop a checklist for this purpose. Time considerations are important for many clients with disabilities. Care must be taken to develop a realistic timeline for case preparation. A very tight timetable can cause problems. Clients with disabilities may use accessible transit services that, because of limited availability, require pre-booking before the date of a meeting. Clients with disabilities may no longer or more, or sorry, clients with disabilities may need longer or more frequent breaks than usual to go to the washroom or take medication. A client with a cognitive or emotional disability may require more time to consider options and make a decision. An interview conducted using sign language interpreter can be time consuming and must be arranged well in advance. Okay, I took a little bit of a break and I uh, hope I'm starting at the same spot. Uh, we have included the information in this section to provide lawyers with guidance that might assist them in representing their clients with disabilities, ensuring that they receive the accommodations they need. However, the best source of information about your client's disability and accommodation needs is from him or her directly. It is often helpful to ask your clients about how disability affects them. Disability organizations can also provide useful information about accommodating specific disabilities. I believe I just read that one over again, but that's okay. Um, new paragraph. Some clients with disabilities may require certain accommodations. Ask clients what, if any, accommodations are required or would be helpful. Clients with accommodation needs will appreciate such a question at the start of an interview or when the interview is scheduled. They can address, for instance, whether they are seating arrangements and environment will permit, permit effective communication with the lawyer, when would be an appropriate time to take a break, and so on. If it is anticipated that there may be a number of accommodation needs, then the lawyer may canvas and address these in advance of the meeting. Lawyers may want to develop a checklist for this purpose. I think I just read that one over again. New paragraph. Time considerations are important for many clients with disabilities. Care must be taken to develop a realistic timeline for case preparation. A very tight timetable can cause problems. Clients with disabilities may use accessible transit services that, because of limited availability, require pre booking for the date of a meeting. Clients with disabilities may need longer or more frequent breaks than usual to go to the washroom or take medication. A client with a cognitive or emotional disability may require more time to consider options and make a decision. An interview conducted using sign language interpreter can be a time consuming and must be arranged well in advance. New paragraph. As with other clients, the lawyer should discuss all aspects of cases fully and frankly with clients who have disabilities. It is essential that clients be questioned about all relevant aspects of their cases, even if questions may be difficult for the clients. It is also essential to make sure that the clients whose disability affects their legal capacity to understand the lawyer's advice. Some techniques that may be useful to assist with communication are as follows. Bullet points. 
Use plain and clear language, not legal terminology or jargon. Bullet point two, ask clients to explain their understanding of what the lawyer has said using their own words or their own alternative means of communication. Encourage clients to ask questions of the lawyer. And final bullet point, encourage clients to tell the lawyer everything that may be relevant while suggesting what information would be of most use to the lawyer. Ask clients what meeting place is best for them. Some clients with disabilities may require home visits because their disability makes it difficult for them to leave their homes. For example, clients with chronic pain may find that travel exacerbates the pain and clients with multiple chemical sensitivity may react adversely to a number of substances in a lawyer's office environment. Visiting clients in their homes will afford them with the accommodation they need. However, some clients with disabilities prefer the confidential setting of a lawyer's office for a meeting. Some people with disabilities prefer the conf or sorry, uh, some people with disabilities live in places that do not afford complete privacy such as group homes, hospitals and supportive housing. Meeting in their place of residence may raise suspicions of other residents, family members or staff and unintentionally divulge confidences. Again, that need for privacy, I guess. Eh? Uh, as has been indicated, oh new paragraph, sorry. As has been indicated, there is no one formula for providing accommodation. Lawyers are advised to ensure that their offices are barrier-free and to ask clients what accommodations, if any, are needed. Lawyers are further advised to educate themselves with respect to specific disabilities and common accommodations associated with such disabilities. Lawyers can do this, for example, by accessing information provided by organizations that provide services for people with particular disabilities. Lawyers can also learn by visiting the websites, some addresses for which are listed in section 4 below, of disability organizations and government agencies. What follows is a brief description of some accommodation issues and measures that pertain to some generally classed disabilities. The information is provided to illustrate generally what accommodation can entail in some selected circumstances. That's the end of page 20 of 30. So I guess we only have 10 more to go. Sorry, I need to have a drink. Four point two. Deaf people and people with hearing loss. For deaf, uh, and then it says uh, bullet note or uh, sorry, uh, footnote. That's what it's called. Footnote eighty nine. For deaf people and people with hearing loss, it will be necessary for lawyers to consider accommodation measures that pertain to facilitating communication between themselves and their clients. Deaf people and people with hearing loss interact with hearing people all the time, and most are comfortable telling you what works for them. No two people who are deaf or have hearing loss communicate in exactly the same way. Each individual uses an individual combination or of communication strategies. The best way to learn how to communicate is to ask what methods of communication the person with a disability prefers. So that's the end of that paragraph. Go to footnote 89. The term deaf is generally used to describe individuals with a severe to profound hearing loss with little or no residual hearing. Some deaf people use sign language to communicate. Others use speech to communicate using the residual hearing and hearing aids, technical devices or cochlear implants and lip reading or speech reading. The term culturally deaf refers to individuals who identify with and participate in the language, culture, and community of deaf people based on sign language. Deaf culture, indicated by a capital D, does not perceive hearing loss and deafness as a disability but as the basis of a distinct cultural group. End of footnote 89. Okay, so... <clears throat> New paragraph. Some individuals who are deaf may have a first language that is gestural. The most commonly used gestural language in Ontario is American Sign Language. Therefore, for many deaf people, English or French is not their first language. Sign languages do not have written forms, so the written skills of a person whose first language is a sign language may appear stilted. The written language should not be perceived as an indicator of education or intelligence. For many deaf people and people with hearing loss, the most important accommodation measures for lawyers to provide will be sign language interpretation. A professional sign language interpreter, knowledgeable in the language and culture of both deaf and hearing people, is the bridge between ASL and, language, and English to a common understanding. 
Ontario Interpreter Services, OIS, is a provincial organization that books qualified interpreters. It is provincially coordinated by the Canadian Hearing Society and Association for the Deaf. Ontario Association for the Deaf. Both groups are part of the OIS Advisory Council. The council establishes the fees charged for interpreting services and maintains a registry of qualified interpreters throughout Ontario. An ethical code as well as a code of confidentiality binds qualified interpreters to act solely as a communication channel. New paragraph. To arrange for an interpreter, a law firm must call their local Canadian Hearing Society office and ask to speak with an OIS staff person. Advance notice of at least two to three weeks as usual, required to or usually required to ensure that a request can be met, although it is possible that an interpreter may be made available on shorter notice. There is a chronic short uh, there is a chronic shortage of interpreters in Ontario. Few work full time and those who do are usually booked weeks, if not months, in advance. New paragraph. For some people with hearing loss, a preferred accommodation is through assistive listening systems. Such technology can render oral spoken communication at meetings, courts, and tribunals accessible through wireless sound transmission. With this technology, people with hearing loss wear wireless receivers while speakers use microphones. A transmitter converts the sound to into infrared or FM signals, which are beamed to those wearing receivers whereupon the signals are converted back into sound. End of uh, page 21 of 30 and also the end of that paragraph. Another accommodation measure for deep, deaf people and people with hearing loss is written captioning. Meetings, for instance, can be made accessible to people with hearing disabilities who have the sufficient written language skills by providing real-time captioning, a word-for-word -word transcription of oral communications projected onto a screen by a specially trained stenographer. An advantageous byproduct of this form of accommodation is a written record of the event for which the captioning was provided. To locate companies that offer captioning services, look in the yellow pages under captioning or contact the local branch of the Canadian Hearing Society. While captioning is a useful communication tool, it should not be used as a substitute for interpreter services between sign language and English. End of paragraph. Email is often used by deaf people and people with hearing loss who have computers and sufficient written language skills in English to communicate just as it was used, just as it is used by hearing individuals. Chat on the internet is also used. Lawyers must be aware that communication over email and chat may not be secure or confidential. End of paragraph. For people who are deafblind, interveners may be used. Interveners facilitate the interaction of a person who is deafblind with other people in the environment. Footnote 90. Interveners can assist people who are deafblind to communicate, for example, using a tactile and or visual form of language or any combination of them. A deafblind person, for reasons of comfort and the protection of privacy, may wish to use or not use a particular intervener that he or she knows. End of paragraph. Footnote 90 states online Rotary Cheshire Homes, uh, HTTP backslash backslash www.rotarycheshirehomes.org backslash definitions period htm. Rotary Cheshire Homes is R-O-T-A-R-Y C-H-E-S-I-H, sorry, again. R O T A R Y C H E S H I R E H O M E S dot org. End of footnote 90. It is important to be aware of potential conflicts of interest if the interpreter or intervener is a family member or caregiver and the possibility that the interpreter or intervener may try to influence the client. Lawyers must ask, ensure that they are ascertaining the wishes of their client. New paragraph. <coughs> Excuse me. For appearances before courts or tribunals, lawyers should contact the relevant registrar to make requests for the accommodation of their clients. For the purposes of a client who is deaf or has hearing loss and is witness in a proceeding, for example, it may be necessary for both sign language interpreter and a real-time captioner to be present. A sign language interpreter can communicate most of the dialogue that occurs in a legal proceeding, but a person who is deaf or has hearing loss may require real-time captioning in addition to sign language interpretation. Through reference to real-time captioning, a person who is deaf or who has hearing loss can access oral concepts that were not translated by the interpreter and they can check to ensure that the interpreter is correctly rendering orally their evidence given 
through sign language. Look, new paragraph. Lawyers must remember Rule 4.068 of the Ontario Rules of Civil Procedure, footnote 91. When commissioning an affidavit for a client who is deaf or has hearing loss and who has limited proficiency in written English or French, the rule requires a lawyer to certify that the affidavit was interpreted to the client by an interpreter who swore or affirmed, affirmed to interpret the contents correctly. End of paragraph. Footnote 91. The Rules of Civil Procedure, RRO 1990, Regulation 194, Rules of Civil Procedure. End of page 22 of 30. A teletypewriter, TTY, also known as text telephone, is an important aid for communication in written format over telephone lines. This machine has a typewriter keyboard, an electronic display, and an attached roll, attached roll of printout tape. Users place standard telephone headsets into cradles on the machine and type messages to receiving parties. The message is transmitted to a TTY on the other end, which also has a real-time electronic display and may also generate a printed copy of the conversation. The other party sees the message on their own screen and on a printout and types back. Using a TTY is similar to using chat technology over the internet. Oh, okay, I never knew that. See, you learn something new every day. I'm disabled too. Uh, okay, so. Communicating via TTY can unfortunately be time consuming depending on the typing skills of interlocutors. interlocutors which is the operator. However, one benefit for lawyers is that exact records of conversations, including instructions, are created as a result by the resultant printouts. End of paragraph. Some clients whose first language is sign language may find it difficult to communicate problems, concepts, and even basic questions through a TTY. In such circumstances, it is preferable to meet in person in the presence of a qualified interpreter. Uh, new paragraph. Bell Canada offers a service known as the Bell Relay Service in which an operator will relay messages between people using regular telephones and people using TTY machines. For lawyers who have not yet purchased TTY machines, this is a useful service. The Bell Relay Service is accessed by calling the following special national access number. TTY is 771 or voice is 1-800-855-0511. That's for TTY on voice line. New paragraph. Additional information about terminology, communication, accommodation in relation to people who are deaf and have hearing loss can be accessed from the breaking sound barriers employing people who are deaf, deafened, or hard of hearing at http w, or backslash backslash www.chs.ca. That's Charlie Harold Stephen .ca backslash en backslash documents hyphen and hyphen publications all lowercase backslash employment backslash index period php while the manual covers workplace issues it contains much relevant general information on the above topics chapter 4.3 vision disabilities for clients with vision disabilities, lawyers must ensure that written communications are provided with an accessible format. Each client defines accessibility for himself or herself. Therefore, the lawyer must ask the client which format is best for them. End of paragraph. For clients who have access to and are familiar with computers with specialized software, documents can be transmitted in electronic text format. The advantage of communicating electronically is that it permits individuals with different levels of vision to be able to convert documents into the specific formats that they prefer. For clients who have access to email, this form of communication may be the easiest. End of paragraph, and that's the end of page 23 of 30. New paragraph. Some clients who are blind may prefer documents and business cards in Braille. Braille is a system that permits people to read by running their fingers over a series of configurations of raised dots. For offices equipped with Braille printers, documents may be converted to into Braille before being sent to clients who require documents in this format. Some people who are blind prefer written materials to be read onto audio tapes as their main conduit to the printed word. Even for those fluent in Braille, tapes can be important because they are often easier and cheaper to prepare and transport than Braille materials. End of paragraph. Lawyers who receive written correspondence on behalf of clients who are blind can use scanning technology to convert such documents into text formats ready for electronic transmission to their clients. 
For lawyers who lack scanning technology, it is important to orally or electronically, for example, through email, advise clients of the contents of such correspondence once received. End of paragraph. For appearances before courts and tribunals, lawyers should contact the relevant registrar and other parties to ask that certain accommodations be provided. For instance, a request can be made for evidence to be converted in advance of hearing into an accessible format so that a client will be able to understand the evidence and instruct his or her lawyer accordingly during a hearing. End of paragraph. Lawyers should consider the applicability of Rule 4.067 of the Rules of Civil Procedure when commissioning an affidavit for a client who is blind. Section 4.4, Communication Disabilities. A communication disability describes a restriction in a person's ability to speak in a manner that can be readily understood, which is associated with a physical or mental impairment. For people with communication disabilities, communication through electronic means may be advantageous for relaying day-to-day -day information. End of paragraph. Communicating with people who have communication disabilities can be time-consuming. At in-person meetings, lawyers can accommodate people with communication disabilities by cooperatively using systems designed to augment or serve as alternatives to speech. People who have limited verbal skills may use one or more augmentative communication devices or systems. Augmentative communication systems make use of objects, pictures, graph symbols, such as those depicted on communication boards, manual signs, finger spelling, or artificial voice outputs. The latter may be controlled by push buttons, puffs of air, eyebrow wrinkles, or other means. People who have significant speech or language impairments often rely on gestures and facial expressions and body movements. That's the end of the paragraph and end of page 2430. New paragraph. There are a number of augmentative communication systems available to people who are nonverbal. Bliss symbolics, bliss symbolics, B L I S S Y M B O L I C S. Bliss symbolics. One example is a graphic language often printed and presented on the surface of a tray, but sometimes in books and increasingly frequently on personal computers. Symbols accompanied by the equivalent word are written within squares. Symbols may have to be presented one at a time. Each can be pointed to and the client asked if it is the desired one or like can scan the symbols and be stopped at the desired one. Some people who are bliss symbolics have mastered a few thousand symbols and can express virtually any idea using them. In addition to bliss symbolics, other codes such as numbers, letters, or shapes can also represent phrases. To use the codes, both communication partners must know the codes or have a chart. End of print. Up. A paragraph. For people who use symbolic languages, a communication assistant who is familiar with the person's particular method of communication may be very important, especially when it comes to interpreting symbols that are newly generated from existing vocabulary. However, because communication assistants often are family members of or provide care to the client, lawyers must be aware of potential conflicts of interest between the client and the assistant and the possibility that the assistant may try to influence the client. It may be necessary to bring in a neutral communication assistant to ascertain the client's wishes. End of paragraph. Resources for the legal community in relation to accommodating the communication needs of people who use augmentative and alternative communication are available at http backslash backslash www.accpc.ca backslash ej hyphen resources dot htm. 4.5. Disabilities that affect mobility. For people with mobility disabilities, the primary form of accommodation that will be required of lawyers is a removal of physical and architectural barriers in law offices. New paragraph. Ontario's Human Rights Code provides that facilities must not discriminate against people with disabilities. The code does not set out specific standards to be followed. However, the Ontario Human Rights Commission has stated that service providers, including lawyers, should conduct an accessibility review of their facilities in order to identify existing barriers and remove them. Footnote 92. Similarly, while the AOTA, footnote 93, which is Accessibility to Ontarians with Disabilities Act, provides for the establishment of accessibility standards for buildings, no such standards currently exist. There are accessibility standards in the Ontario Building Code Act 92 and its associated regulations, footnote 94, but these apply only to new or renovated buildings. 
These standards are quite minimal in some respects. There are more comprehensive standards available through the Canadian Standards Association, but the use of these are voluntary. Footnote 95. Seems to be a theme here. It's all these rules and regulations, but nobody really has to follow them. We can't really make yet. But it all looks good on paper, doesn't it? <clears throat> okay, so footnotes. We need to go to 92, 93, 94, and 95. Okay, so 92, online. <coughs> Ontario Human Rights Commission, HTTP backslash backslash www.ohrc.on.ca backslash en backslash issues backslash disability. Footnote 93, AOTA, Supra Note 28, Footnote 94, Building Code Act 1992, SO 1992. Chapter 23 and Ontario Regulation 350 backslash 06. Footnote 95. The Canadian Standards Association, CSA, is an independent nonprofit membership based organization that develops standards in a number of areas, including construction. Further information on the CSA and standards relating to accessible design can be found online at http backslash backslash www.csa.ca backslash capital D default dot ASP question mark language equals English end of footnote 95 end of page 2530 new paragraph accessibility related to structural elements within a building is only part of the broader issue of access there are potential barriers that are created by badly placed furniture unsuitable floor coverings and poor lighting there are also potential barriers in the environment outside of buildings, including inaccessible sidewalks, inaccessible parking spaces, and uncleared snow and ice. Especially that one, everybody. Especially in Kitchener, they got a bylaw, but nobody enforces it. Anyway, it's hard for disabled people to walk on that stuff. You know, you could slip and fall, and maybe sue you. I don't know. Who wants to sue anybody? Can't we all just get along? Anyway, uh, new paragraph. Transportation can be a major barrier to people who use mobility aids. It is important to check transportation arrangements carefully with clients who use specialized public transportation services such as Wheeltrans Toronto, Paratranspo Ottawa, or accessible public transit services in other municipalities. For example, some services require notice for ride bookings, and this has to be taken into account when planning client meetings. Unexpected emergency legal meetings may have to take place in the homes of people with mobility disabilities who rely on public transit services. End of paragraph. It is important to ensure that appropriate, for example, accessible parking spaces are available for clients who arrive in their own vehicle and that the entrance of the building is accessible. If someone else drives the client, then a safe and accessible drop-off area for the client and a parking area for the person who drove them is also required. For appearances before the courts, oh, new paragraph. For appearances before courts and tribunals, lawyers should contact the relevant registrar to ensure that accessible rooms are booked for proceedings involving clients with mobility disabilities. Unfortunately, there are still many courthouses with inaccessible rooms. Footnote 96. Footnote 96 says report of the Disability Issues Committee, making Ontario's courts fully accessible to persons with disabilities. December 2006. Online Court of Appeal of Ontario. HTTP www. Ontariocourts.on.ca backslash accessible underscore courts backslash en backslash report underscore courts underscore disabilities dot htm. Yeah, the report's right there. Good. 
Hopefully I can download it. <coughs> Sorry. So that link works. Okay, so. The actions of a person with a mental health psychiatric disability may seem different from that. What is perceived of as a normal what is perceived of as normal among people who have no such experiences. Do not be overly concerned by a sudden change in mood, speech pattern, or volume, a burst of energy or anger, or communication that is not understood. All of these may be aspects of the disability or side effects of medication. Lawyers should inquire of clients as to any such side effects so that accommodation can be provided both in law office and in court. It is important to be respectful, patient, flexible, understanding, and positive when interacting with people with mental health and psychiatric disabilities. Resist the tendency to focus on the person's behavior and instead focus on the overall goal of the conversation. End of page 26 of 30. And that paragraph. Is there a reference there? Sorry, I just need to. We have a footnote 97. Oh, mental health, psychiatric disabilities, footnote 97. It's on the it's on the uh, 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 chapter heading. Not footnote 97, there are several terms used to describe people with mental health issues and there has been long-standing debate and no consensus on appropriate terminology. Other terms in use include consumer survivors, psychiatric survivors, psychiatric disability, mental health disability, people with mental health issues, people with mental illness, and madness. That's just the angry ones, I guess. Eh? Um, however, it should be noted that Quote, many psychiatric system survivors are unwilling to see themselves as disabled, end quote, cited in Peter Beresford. What have madness and psychiatric system survivors have to do with the disability and disability studies? 2015.1 Disability in Society 167 at 169. That's the end of page 26 of 30. New paragraph. People with mental health, psychiatric disabilities may occasionally have difficulty concentrating. If this is the case, consider breaking down tasks into manageable steps and arranging shorter meeting periods. Written instructions, reminders, and clear communication can facilitate interaction and address memory loss and concentration concerns. Chapter 4.7, Intellectual Developmental Disabilities. There is some con controversy about appropriate terminology in the context of intellectual developmental disabilities. However, in current practice, the two terms, intellectual disability and developmental disability, are frequently used interchangeably. New paragraph. Generally, intellectual developmental disabilities are present from childhood and can affect a person's intellectual development and functional capacity in areas such as language ability, learning, and self-care. New paragraph. In the past, the terms mental retardation, dumb and slow were used to describe these disabilities, but are now avoided because they carry such pejorative, discriminatory connotations. Mm -hmm. Lawyers can accommodate their clients with intellectual developmental disabilities by ensuring that appropriate dignity enhancing language is used to describe the disabilities. It is often assumed, or new, new paragraph. It is often assumed that individuals with intellectual developmental disabilities are incapable to instruct counsel by virtue of their disability. The assumption is this assumption is not necessarily true. It is important the lawyer it is important that a lawyer assess each client's capacity individually. See the discussion regarding capacity to instruct in section 3.2 above. Or in this case I guess here it um, okay so a new paragraph. Some people with intellectual developmental disabilities are shy and easily intimidated and they may not be aware of things in the common experience of others. Because of vulnerability and dependence on others, they may be afraid to express their own ideas without support. This can result from the environment in which they have spent their lives. Many people with intellectual developmental disabilities have led sheltered lives, either with their parents in a group home or increasingly rare 
in an institution or increasingly rarely in an institution. They may have been denied educational opportunities. They most almost certainly have been denied social and employment opportunities. New paragraph. Clients with intellectual developmental disabilities should be treated like others unless there is a compelling reason not to do so. Do not underestimate the capacities and potential of clients with intellectual developmental disabilities. When talking with clients, lawyers should use clear and concise concepts and avoid complex sentences. Repetition and careful explanation are important. When something is really important, lawyers should say so explicitly to clients. Be alert to the possibility that clients may misinterpret jargon or technical terminology while seeming to use it appropriately. Page 27 of 30 is complete. New paragraph. When interacting with clients with intellectual developmental disabilities, lawyers should clearly explain the purpose of the meeting. The lawyer should also explain to the client that it is their decision whether they wish to take the lawyer's advice. Due to socialization in group homes, institutions, or the family home, direction from authority figures can be seen as non-optional to people with intellectual developmental disabilities. New paragraph. A client with an intellectual developmental disability may benefit from the support of a person who they know and trust, for example, a family member, friend, or an advocate when they meet with lawyers. However, lawyers must be aware of the potential conflicts of interest between the client and the family member, friend, or advocate. As with other clients with disabilities, it is important to find out from a client with an intellectual developmental disability what accommodations are required. 4.8. Learning Disabilities. A learning disability is defined as a neurological dysfunction that interferes with the brain's capacity to accurately store, process, or produce information either spoken or written or tactile. It is not caused by visual, hearing, or motor impairments or by intellectual or psychiatric disabilities. Learning disabilities are frequently found in associated with a variety of other medical conditions, for example, fetal alcohol syndrome and fragile X syndrome. New paragraph. Generally, individuals with learning disabilities have a few obvious problems collecting information. But they may experience difficulty screening, interpreting, recalling, processing, or translating that information. Some specific learning disabilities are dyslexia, severe problems reading, dysgraphia, severe problems writing, dysphagia, severe problems developing spoken language, and dyscalculia, severe problems doing mathematics. While learning disabilities do not disappear, individuals living with them can learn strategies to compensate for their disabilities. End of paragraph. Uh, because learning disabilities are largely invisible, they are often not taken seriously. Lawyers can demonstrate that they accept and respect the client's disabilities and accommodation needs by inquiring as to whether accommodation is needed and in what form. End of paragraph. Clients with learning disabilities may take more time than others to reason through a situation or set of facts. Lawyers may need to provide accommodation in the form of longer meetings with clients with learning disabilities. Other forms of accommodation may include the provision in advance of a written schedule for a meeting, a written summary of meeting minutes, reminders for meetings, or a written list of tasks to be completed. Lawyers must discuss with their clients what forms of accommodation are desired when the working relationship first begins. Accommodation measures can be assessed periodically to determine whether they are working. That's the end of page 28 of 30. Section 5, Web Resources. For further information, the following websites might, may be consulted. Arch Disability Law Center, also known as Arch Disability Law Management. Uh, www.archdisabilitylaw.ca ARCH is a community legal aid clinic dedicated to defending and advancing the equality rights of people with disabilities in Ontario. Its website provides a description of the services it offers as well as information on disability law initiatives in litigation and law reform. Yeah. Which they get paid very handsomely for. Because that's where all the money goes to is all the people managing disability law. Not actually making sure it's actually carried out because it's not actually law, it's just suggestions. They just call it law. Canadian Council on Rehabilitation and Work, www.ccrw.org. CCRW is a network of organizations and individuals that provides leadership and programs and services for job seekers with disabilities and businesses committed to equal equity and inclusion. The site provides information on programs, services for job seekers and businesses interested in providing accommodation for employees with disabilities. Council of Canadians with Disabilities, 
www.ccdonline.ca. CCD is a consumer-controlled organization that advocates for the equality rights of people with disabilities. This site describes the philosophy of membership of the CCD and includes information on their advocacy work in a number of areas including technology, human rights, international development, social policy and transportation. Disability-related policy in Canada www.disabilitypolicy.ca. This website presents policy discussions on the funding, supply, and availability of a range of products and services for disability-related needs, including personal supports and technical aids and equipment. Disability Research Information Page, www.ccsd.ca backslash DRIP. Drip. This website provides centralized access to information about disability research on a wide range of topics, including employment, education, health care, and supports and services available for people with disabilities. Enable Link, www.abilities.ca. Enable Link provides links to Canadian and international resources on a wide variety of disability related topics, including links to directories, articles, organizations, advocacy, and support groups, services, and products. Legal Aid Ontario, don't waste your time. Uh, www.legalaid.on.ca Notorious for taking $647 million, watch it disappear and not hold anybody's rights accountable. Anyway, biggest scam going. Keeps a lot of lawyers in business though. Legal Aid is available to low income individuals and disadvantaged communities for a variety of legal problems including criminal matters, family disputes, immigration and refugee hearings and poverty law issues such as landlord tenant disputes, disability support and family benefits payments. All of which are tribunal systems. All because they do that cooperative law. But it's not conspiracy. At least it was in, in, in Orange County. Had to let Go all 29 prosecutors for prosecutorial misconduct. Ooh, collaborative law may not be so good after all, eh? Page 29 to 30. Yeah, because of that, the worst murderer in the history of San Diego may go free. How about that, eh? What we don't know about what they're doing to protect us won't hurt them, eh? Until it gets revealed, then it hurts all of us. Note to the weary. And hopefully to the wise. Anyway, uh, next page, which is 30 of 30. Oh, my God, we're on the last page. You can hear me stop talking, at least for a few minutes. Anyway, uh, Ministry of Community and Social Services, www.accesson.ca. Backslash EN, backslash MCSS, backslash programs, backslash accessibility, backslash Ontario accessibility laws, all no spaces, all with caps, Ontario capitalized, accessibility capitalized, laws uh, capitalized, and again, no spaces. Backslash index, dot ASPX. This link provides information about the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, the Ontarians with Disabilities Act, and detailed information about accessibility for people with disabilities. Ontario Human Rights Commission, www.ohrc.on.ca backslash an. The Commission administers the Ontario Ra Human Rights Code, which protects people in Ontario against discrimination in employment, accommodation, goods, services, and facilities, membership in vocational associations and trade unions. The site provides information about the investigation complaints under the code and provides other educational materials about human rights in Ontario, such as a guide to the duty to... such as a guide to the duty to accommodate so how come the courts and judges and all that don't have it oh because the onus is on you right anyway it's your system not ours the more we try and use it the more it proves that persons with disabilities online www.pwd-online.ca this site is sponsored by the federal government. It provides links to both national and provincial information sources for a wide range of programs and services available to people with disabilities, including housing, employment, assisting, assistive technology, tax benefits, and transportation. United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Now, you politicians and judges and lawyers out there, pay particular attention to this one, eh? United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, www.un.org, backslash disabilities, backslash. 
This site gives information on the history and development of the convention, the background behind the provisions, and the current work taking place on the convention. Actually, that's good for everybody. Why doesn't everybody check that out? So that's page 30 of 30. Uh, then on page 31, I guess, of 30. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, there's Appendix A, or A, sorry. Language that is and is not considered to enhance the dignity of people with disabilities. I'll put form in bullet, bullet form. See, I can't even talk it properly anymore. That's why diction is very important. Okay, so anyway. Um, putting the person first by saying, for example, people with disabilities or women with disabilities is now generally considered more appropriate than saying disabled persons or especially the disabled. Second bullet point. People with disabilities are often referred to as consumers of disability-related services. People with a strong commitment to deaf culture capitalize the word deaf. Some people prefer to be known as autistic rather than a person with autism. Disability is a more appropriate term than handicap. Physically challenged. Per Personally, I think both of them are discriminatory, handicapped or disability. We've got just as much ability as everybody else. It's just in a different way. And oftentimes when you say that word disability, it's not the person who you're focusing on that has a disability, it's the person who's expressing it. Or reacting to the person with a disability. Because it's society's disability to accept us as we are. Next bullet point. Non-disabled is considered more appropriate than able-bodied. Refer to a wheelchair user rather than to someone confined or bound to a wheelchair. Usage in Canada especially strongly favors intellectual disability or developmental disability as opposed to me mental retardation. And completely healthy people can have mental retardation too. It's when your thought process isn't working exactly right. So it's, it's uh, all encompassing. Uh, misnomer, mental retardation. Anyway, you get uh, like I said, time to change the language and the talking points. <clears throat> People with a lengthy history of psychiatric treatment or hospitalization often refer to themselves as survivors or consumer survivors. There are several other terms used to describe people with mental health issues. And there has been long-standing debate, no consensus on appropriate terminology. Other terms in use include psychiatric survivors, psychiatric disability, mental disabilities, people with mental illness, people with mental health issues, and madness. Yeah, those, those ones are really good, those last ones. Probably from Canadian Mental Health Association, I would imagine, right? It is not appropriate to speak of someone as suffering from a disability or as afflicted with it or as a victim of it, except in some particular circumstances. For example, people who are affected by thalidomide refer to themselves as thalidomide victims. Uh, no, that's what the law called them. Thalam, thalidomide victims. That's what they called them in the court case. So it was adopted, right? Anyway, uh, they're victims of thalidomide or government victims more more aptly anyway. it is appropriate to use words like see as you would normally when speaking to a person who is blind it is preferable to use the terms partial vision or low vision rather than legal blindness the terms physically challenged and mentally challenged are not in general use in Canada well that's funny because I'm physically challenged but, oh disability is much better than physically challenged eh? anyway it's more about the way you're treated with respect or disrespected. That's the uh, main thing, main gist of it, uh, coming from a person who is disabled. I mean, everybody needs to be respected, right? Um, for some reason, society teaches us that people that are less than us are able to be considered less than you. And uh, maybe that's the problem. Like I said, again, we need to find value. If we can see our value in others, then I guess that would be a better way to look at things. Um, 
probably blissfully ignorant of uh, that ever happening, but, well, you can always hope and try. And like I said, I hope. I do hope. I hope this does well for all you lawyers and judges and everybody out there, and even for the general public. If you didn't have time to read it, hopefully I wasn't too uh, all over the place. Anyway, thank you again for your time. Hope it finds everybody well. Stay safe out there. Again, you're the only one who is uh, going to keep yourself safe. Okay? Anyway, um, thanks. Have a good day. And we'll see you next time. Next time, we're going to be actually reading the Guide for Parliamentarians from the UN. And I'm sure it's more than just parliamentarians. It should be. But, you know, this is for the public as well. Well, that you will hear what they're expected, what is expected of these people. And then that should hopefully light a fire under your butts to go, you know what? They're not even meeting the expectation. At least we should look at it. Mr. Trudeau, I'm still waiting for you to take me up on the boxing challenge. Uh, we're just trying to make you aware that there's a problem. And you're really trying hard not to be aware. So anybody who gets a chance, please see the challenge video. And uh, send a link to Mr. Trudeau or, you know, any and all of the politicians. You know, you can send one to Kathleen Wynne, uh, you know, because uh, maybe she want to box with me instead. I mean, maybe, maybe there's other politicians out there that don't even have to be invited to go, you know what, this is a serious issue and maybe we should uh, raise the issue. So even if it's in jest, uh, you know, we raise money for, for uh, charity to raise, you know, awareness. You know, the, the main thing is to acknowledge there is a problem, that it's a serious problem, that it's exponential in the way that it affects the persons that it does, which is the disabled. It also is a mass means of being another way of keeping us less than others. Um, you know, it's all about respect and how you want to be treated. Treat other people the way you want to be treated. And they're going to get that message from me at court on Tuesday. So I go to court for a confirmation hearing on uh, Tuesday at uh, 10.30 a.m., uh, 85 Frederick Street, courtroom 104. That's at the corner of Frederick and Edna in, uh, or sorry, Frederick and Charles. Duke Street, sorry, Frederick and Duke Street, you see, brain injury. I'm all over the place. I like Edna and Charles and Duke all together. But anyway, um, no, it's on the corner of uh, Duke and Frederick Streets, 85. Uh, it looks like a big fortress, you know, a glass house, concrete and glass. Shouldn't throw stones if you live in glass houses, right? Anyway, um, yeah, so come on down. Have a laugh with me. You'll get to see me tell them what I think. Uh, anyway, I don't cry. I don't care anyway, because <laughs> I don't care what they think. The only thing I care about is the court of public opinion, because that's the only one that matters. So uh, anyway, hopefully you're paying attention. Hopefully it keeps you safe until the next time. Enjoy. Have a good day, and don't forget to leave your comments. Okay, that's everybody's problem. <laughs>